so so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and share share what we're doing, sort of in our little science world with the community that it actually impacts. Uh, like Lee said, I'm going to talk to you about one study in particular that's, that focuses on the larvae of the river herring that you count. You're obviously not counting these guys because they're hard to see, and which is why I brought a, a microscope. But you're probably aware that these fish, as adults, come in from the ocean to spawn in your pond. And it's an interesting strategy. It's what salmon do, as you know. They're what's called anadromous, and they, they live mostly offshore. They come in fresh waters to spawn, and then they head back to sea. And eventually the larvae grow up into juveniles, and the juveniles look like the adults, but just smaller. And then the juveniles later head to sea themselves. And I can kind of summarize that life cycle here with this figure. Um, so we can start with the adults living in the marine environment, head into fresh waters. That's where they spawn or, or lay their eggs, their uh, bottom dwelling eggs or demersal eggs. So the eggs are on the bottom or on substrate near the bottom. Uh, that from those eggs hatch little tiny larvae. And those little larvae are what we call planktonic, so up in the water column. And those larvae grow, if they survive, into little juveniles. And the juveniles will stay in the pond for it's highly variable up until, or it can be from anywhere from July to December uh, when they head to marine waters. Estuary is, is mentioned here. We don't have much of an estuary in, in your system, but they head to the canal. And then they head offshore to the continental shelf, and in three or four years they mature and come into fresh waters themselves as well. Uh, this is footage from Stony Brook out in Brewster, so on the sort of the outer cape. Uh, it's one of the most popular locations to, to watch herring for the public. Um, you guys actually have a decent um, location in between the pond and the canal. I forget the name of that little park there, but you can see a lot of herring coming up there. Um, but, but this is a very popular spike site amongst the, the locals and the tourists. And this was 2015, a particularly good year where there were a lot of fish coming up. We went back the year after and we never saw densities like this. So some of the ongoing river herring related research we have going on in my lab. Uh, like I said, we're looking at the larval river herring. And not only are we looking at great herring pond, we're also looking at three other systems to kind of compare the the three, the four systems to see if there are char characteristics of one or a couple that are very good for larval growth and some conditions that might be bad. We're also looking at juvenile hair, so after they grow up into juveniles but still are in the pond, we're looking at their feeding variability, specifically in great herring pond, and what's driving their, their immigration or their, their migration from fresh waters out into the ocean. And we also developed a camera system that we put in the Monument River near the Great Herring, um, the Herring Pond Motel by the canal. And then we're also, we have a separate project up in Maine looking at nursery habitat variability. And when I say nursery habitat, I'm talking about the freshwaters. And we also have a couple studies that are looking at the feeding of the adults out in the ocean. But today I'm going to focus on these first three and just touch on each of them briefly. And first, going into the, the larval study, and these are pictures of, of two larvae underneath the microscope, and again, we'll put these out for you guys to take a look at. These are our four sites. We've got one just south of Boston, up in Weymouth, at Wickens Pond. Lake Nipponicket is a very shallow pond, um, surrounded by cranberry bogs and very few houses. Uh, Great Herring Pond, as you know, and then Upper Mill Pond is, is the predominant pond uh, that's, that's associated with the Stony Brook <coughs> that you saw earlier. So those are our four sites. Uh, we had two years of field work where we went out and sampled in the ponds. And we sampled weekly in each of them. We did a plankton tow. We towed plankton out through the water to catch the, the baby, baby fish. We also did a separate plankton tow to catch the food of the fish. And then we also measure properties such as temperature uh, with depth. We measure temperature, pH, oxygen, and total dissolved solids. And then back in the lab, once we have these, these samples of larvae, 
We can do we can do many things. We can certainly count the larvae to see how many are there, but we also can look at these structures in their heads called ear stones or otoliths and look at how fast they're growing. And I'll talk to you more about that. But I'm as as we kind of alluded to, I'm a marine scientist and I'm an oceanographer and I'm used to going out on big ships and towing big plankton nets through the water out in the open ocean. Uh, and I thought it was really cool to be able to study essentially a marine fish, a, a fish that's very important in marine waters, and do the same type of work, but because they spawn in fresh waters, tow my plankton nets through these little ponds. And, and these are critical food web components out in the ocean, and to have them spawn in your backyard is, is really neat, and to be able to study them on a small boat it, is even cooler to me. So what we do on, on our little lab boat is we go out and we tow a plankton net behind the boat, and we do these little loopy loops and tow the net for about 10 minutes. And in that net, we have we have we have the fish larvae. We also have a lot of the zooplankton nets out there. And we have to we have to to preserve those larvae, and then we bring them back and we count them and look at all sorts of things that are going on. And there, Andre is preserving the sample in alcohol. And then I'm doing a separate little net toe back there for zooplankton. And then I, I also, before that, did a, um, a pass with an instrument to take to take water column here. So here's the sample coming aboard. We have a bunch of goop, or, or mostly clodocerins in this case, but a couple of small herring larvae there. Back in the lab, we sort them out and we put them in their own vial. They look mostly like that when they're perhaps two weeks old or so. Again, that separate toe for zooplankton, we get a lot of clodocerins uh, and copepods. And then we do a separate cast for, for water quality type parameters. And in Great Herring Pond specifically, if we look at the trends of temperature throughout the year, it's a pretty remarkable, I mean, it's, it's a temperate environment. You guys are well aware that it's cold in winter and warm in the summer. But the, the lake undergoes drastic changes in temperature from, from May to, to August. And that's, that's when the larvae are there. The, the, the fish are coming up to spawn in April and May. The larvae are out there from May to June. Uh, and there's a huge range in temperature just, just from May to June and July. If you look at the plot on the right, that's the, the zooplankton, the food that's available to the baby fish, the, the, and the larvae and the juveniles. And you can see a, a notable crash in the zooplankton. This is pretty typical for all freshwater ponds. But the juvenile fish that are staying around into August, September, October, hardly have anything to eat, surprisingly. But they themselves have likely had that it impacted the availability. So there, there are, there are mill, perhaps millions of juvenile herring out there, and they're chomping away, and they are largely the result of that crash. Although it's possible that the adults themselves are going in there and, and causing the crash, the crash of the, the larger zone, like the, the Daphnis. That's something that we're actually looking into. If we look at our four ponds that we're studying, and we look at the number of larvae that we collected by date, so this is, these are dates one week apart, and then our four different ponds, Great Herring Pond is on the left in pink. Uh, we can see it has some of the, the largest number of abundances of fish larvae out there. Um, compared to Upper Mill Pond, it's pretty close to the same, um, but many, many more than Lake Nicanicket and even Whitman's Pond, which is a fairly <coughs> large, very large run in the state. And of course, you see the decline in abundances as these larvae both die and grow too large for our nets. But it's mostly initially uh, mortality. So these are larger larvae, smaller larvae. You have a lot more, a lot more small larvae, and many of them die before they come to you. I mentioned the otolith or ear stone that these fishes have. Uh, we actually have something similar in our ears, and we use it for balance. Uh, they're called otoliths, and they are our window into many factors that are going on in the life of these larvae. And this tiny little structure, smaller than a sand, a sand grain, has rings on it, which is akin to what? Trees. 
But in this case, these rings are daily instead of annual. So each of these rings, if we count them, we know exactly how old that baby fish was. So that gives us an idea of, of age. We know when we caught it, and so we can count the number of days backwards and get an idea of when it hatched. We can also get an idea of how fast it's growing because we can, under a microscope, measure the distances between those rings, and that's an indication of how fast it's growing. And we can also look sort of back in time to see how large the larva, larva was at a given day because the distance from the center to a, a given ring is proportional to its length. So lots of information can be gleaned from these ovals. Yes, that's a question. Yeah. Yeah. Where you are. Do adults go much slower? The layers? The wind, do you count? Yeah, they do. So the so, yearly for adults? So absolutely. You get annual rings in adults. And that's really it's because of the, the daily rings that kind of stack up differently. But um, they are so tight in adults that you can't really see the daily rings. They become annual rings. Yeah. And feel free to stop me if you have questions. So from, from just ages, and then we measure the larvae, we can get relationships like uh, size on the left versus age on the bottom. And we, we have our different ponds here. And the slope of these lines is an indicator of how fast the larvae are growing. But we can also put, so we use this relationship with, with length to, to essentially say how many larvae do we have in each kind of age class or age. So we, we assign an age to a given length. We know how many larvae occur in a, in, a, in a length class. And from that, we can get mortality rates. And that's how fast the larvae are dying. And so here we have the number of larvae out there on the, on the left versus their age, and you can see a steep decline in the number of larvae at a given age. And we have two ponds in this case, and we can see that Great Heron Pond, which is the pink, has a less steep line than Whitman's Pond, indicating that the mortality rate for that for Great Heron Pond is a little bit lower. And that might be due to better conditions. Another thing we can do with these oaths is look at what's going on between the one, the initial population of young larvae, which are very abundant, and the late population of what we call the survivors, which are not very abundant. And we can compare the growth, the same growth periods in the two populations. So early larval growth, or the entire larval growth of the young larvae, say the first seven days, we can look at the same seven day period and the survivors, not worry about this extra growth out here, compare the early growth to the initial population and see if there's something going on with the survivors. And what we see in Great Herring Pond is that the survivors are the ones that indeed grew faster as young larvae. So it's the slow growers that appear to be dying off. And this is just day of life, and then the measurement of those rings that I showed you. And we call that selective mortality. There's some, there's some selection process going on for the fast growers to survive. Do only bony fish have them? Uh, Carolina's fish have something a little bit different. And jawless? Jawless fishes? Do they have them? I don't think they do. Okay. I'm not sure. They're very cool, and they're been, you know, the, our, my colleagues that study invertebrates, they're jealous that we can, we can get the names of our organism of interest, and they, they're at a loss for that. Alright, so we can also compare the different lakes in terms of the growth rates of the fish, the larvae out there. And if we, what we have here is, again, the distance between those rings on the oval as our indicator of growth rate at each day of life. And we're showing that Great Herring Pond actually has a good bit slower growth than the two other ponds that we've analyzed so far, Whitman's and Upper Mill Pond. 
One thing that differs between those ponds is that Great Barrier Pond is cooler. So we think that's mostly a temperature driven effect rather than a food availability effect. So there's no need to worry about that. So moving on from the larval study to a quick touch upon our juvenile study. So these are the juvenile herring that, that after their larval stage, they become juveniles. They look like herring, but smaller. Uh, as you know, the Great Herring Pond flows out through the Monument River into the Cape Cod Canal. And our fish were collected as they were emigrating, so at the Great Herring Pond, or at the Herring Run Motel, um, my colleague collected them on a weekly basis there. So our approach was to create a time series for these herring as they were emigrating the sea. And we did, we had two types of analyses. We used stable isotopes, which are an indicator of what they're eating. Not exactly, but um, I'll talk about it in a second, kind of where they're eating the pond. And we also use the otoliths of the juveniles to get at how old they are, and we relate that to how large they are to get size at age, which is essentially growth rate. Importantly, we had our time series of zooplankton availability. We also had our stable isotope signature of mussels. So we went to the boat ramp that you saw, we found some mussels, we analyzed those. They are an indicator of what we call the open water food web. So out in the middle of the lake or pond, in the, in the water column, there are tiny little algae and copepods and everything. That's sort of the open water signature. And we also collected snails. Snails eat the algae that's near the shoreline, and they are an indicator of the, sh the shoreline signature, or the shoreline food webs. So here we have a plot of with time on the bottom, and carbon-13, which is again our indicator of, of where the, the herring are eating. So if we go up on the axis, that's more shore-based, more like those snails. If we go down the plot, that's more of an open water signature or pelagic. You can see that early in the year, the net, we've got Two species are alewife and blueback. You probably know that river herring can comprise two species. Um, alewife come in early, so we only have alewife early in the year. So July, there's a lot of food available. Um, alewife have a very narrow range when prey is abundant and a very sort of open water signature. That switches to, that increases a little bit when that zooplankton crashes. And that increases due to the crash of zooplankton and its effect on the phytoplankton in the pond. You can also see that blueback have a very narrow range and they stay this sort of open water signature throughout. But alewife, interestingly, have a lot of variability. Most of them are certainly are feeding pelagically with the bluebacks. But there are a few individuals scattered up there that have this more shoreline signature. They're eating near the shoreline. If we group our sort of shoreline feeders and our open water feeders, we can uh, create two relationships. This is, on the left, is fish size. And then on the bottom is essentially age. You can ignore the degree days. That just accounts for temperature variability. And we can see that at a given age, the shoreline feeders are much, much larger than the more open water feeders. And so, and the, again, these are fish that are heading to sea. And so, essentially, when they head to sea, if they had fed near the shoreline, they're upwards of one and a half to two times larger than those that stay in the open parts of the pond. So the bottom line is shoreline habitat is important for these juvenile herring. They grow faster if they're, if they're near the shores and feeding near shores. Uh, they immigrate to sea at a larger size. And because they're larger when they immigrate, theoretically they should have much better survival at sea when they do immigrate. And briefly switching gears to our camera system. Here's the Herring Run Motel. 
lovely pool that I think at one point was actually used by, by people that stayed there. Um, it's got these little steps that go down to it around. So I guess people swim on that. But I, or maybe they turned, later turned it into part of the river. Uh, we have our camera system set up right over here where it gets very narrow. So it's a great spot to watch essentially every fish that comes out of the system without worrying that you're missing them. Our camera is on the far side, and this, this board down here on the bottom is just sort of a backboard or black background. Uh, and then, so, so the camera is kind of in the middle, and then to the left of the camera is a, an infrared light, so we can see these fish at night. And so we only film a narrow swath because we're only concerned about the fish passing them. We don't, we don't need to bother with the data associated with a larger image. And we've recorded, last year we, we put this out in June, and we essentially continuously recorded for six months, so all the way till, till January. And the immigration of these herring juvenile is very sporadic. Uh, and as you can see, a lot go by at a single time. And then there can be hours that go without any herring whatsoever. So we're now in the, in the process of how do we actually go about counting these fish. Uh, and it's going to take a computer scientist to, I'm actually meeting with one next week to talk about how we're going to do this. But if we have a continuous time series of these fish and when they head to sea, we can get at things like what drives their immigration timing. Importantly, we can count all the juveniles, or at least get a decent estimate. It's going to be difficult when like, one near the camera is blocking the others behind it, but if we can get an estimate, uh, we can relate that estimate of juveniles to the number of adults that came in and get an idea of how, how good your ponds are for producing juveniles ahead and see. Essentially, like a number of juveniles per adult is kind of like the holy grail for pond health in terms of river here. So just a few conclusions. Nursery habitat or freshwater nursery habitat for larval river herring can be variable. This translates to growth and mortality differences for the larvae. Uh, what's important for the larvae and the juveniles? Certainly zooplankton, that's what they're eating. Uh, we're not yet sure about other factors that we're measuring yet. Uh, we're just now analyzing the data. I showed you that shoreline habitat can be very, very important. We don't know much about predators, and this is this is this is important to acknowledge. Um, but it's possible there's an important role for predators in uh, in their survival and their numbers. And I think a balanced system is important. I'm not saying go out and kill the large amount of bass or the predators of river herring to save river herring, um, but it is an unknown, an unknown for sure. The camera system. We're hopefully in the, in the beginning stages of getting an idea of how good your pond is for producing juveniles. Uh, it certainly is a, first, a good first step that we hope to expand to, to other systems. So if we can put these, this type of camera system out in other systems, we can kind of get an idea of how your pond compares to many others in terms of productivity. That's all I have, except that I've got larvae that we're going to put out under a a microscope. I've even got some uh, adults that you or the kids might be interested in, in looking at, as well as um, some of the juveniles. So, uh, next slide. Do they spawn once and die, or do they? No, they, they're repeat spawns. So they're, 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 they're not like salmon. They're not sense. exactly like salmon. Great. 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 <laughs> I might have missed this, but the ponds that you showed us, were they matched or were they looking for different? We were. So they're, the same thing. <coughs> they're a little bit different. Uh, Nip and Nick is very shallow, so in that regard, it differs a whole lot. Um, the others are a little bit shallower than Great Herring Pond. You guys have a, a, a deep, cold water mass down there that doesn't really turn over much, and I think that's why you have um, trout. Is that right? I don't remember. It's a, we've got some salmonids in there that I think like that cold one. Um, we also, we pick based on 
the number of houses that surround them, the agriculture, uh, urbanization, uh, as well as we needed a boat ramp. So that was important to get a power boat out there to throw that ramp in there. Yes. What's the lifespan of the, and how many times might they return to the Great Orange to spawn? I don't know. I think they can be upwards of eight years old. So you might get individuals that spawn five times. If they, if they mature at three, and the oldest are eight or nine, but I think most of the biomass will start spawning between three to five fish. Yeah. So most of the fish are going to be three to five. They're, they're an important fish, thanks to eat them. There's a lot of commercial fishing pressure offshore, so there's a lot of bycatch of river herring in the, in the Atlantic herring fishery. Uh, so many don't live past five. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, it was about 15 or 17 years ago when people were no longer allowed to take the herring from the streams unless they were a certified American Indian. Mm -hmm. And um, I wonder what. And then there was a lot of complaint that maybe the control needed to be for the offshore fishing and, and let the people. And it was interesting because new immigrants coming in from Vietnam or, or Cambodia um, were very quick at finding where the herring run was. And so we used to tell them what the regulations were. And there was a state law that you would fall back unless there were local laws. And, and I assume that you still can't take them. There's a, a, a complete moratorium on taking them. And, and is there any thought that someday you know, people will take them again? Yes, so I, I think uh, Massachusetts has passed some sort of protocol for individual towns proposing to open their own, their, their local runs. And that's been done up in Waterville, the, the um, just north of, um, I forget. There's, there's a bunch of lakes that have a very good run and it hasn't been declining as much. And the town said, I, we want to open it up to some fishing. And they had to go through this whole process of writing a proposal about how they would do that and how they would keep an eye on things and what they would do if things got worse. And they're going to open it. I think that's Lake Building. Lake, lake Building. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in addition to herring and alewife, are you seeing striped bass uh, up, up these small creeks in the herring pond, etc.? Mm -hmm. I don't think we've seen any striped bass largely. Um, and we certainly, we are, we're, the gear that we use, would, we wouldn't know if there are adults coming mm -hmm. up. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Straight past the most of their spawning much further south. Oh. This is mostly a foraging run. I see. Fishing here. I see. They typically stay in the estuaries and mm -hmm. marine environment. Yeah. Thank you. So I think I read that uh, a female herring can lay something like 80,000 eggs. Does that sound about right? That sounds about right. I mean, I, I just Googled this stuff. Like yeah. And, and then multiplying that by. 140 some thousand herring that were counts coming in at the canal and, and having that, assuming maybe equal male, female. This still comes out billions of eggs. That they, they, yeah. Yeah. It's, that's why the mortality rates are 99%. Yeah. Percent. Yeah. They, that's just their reproductive strategy. Would you like to introduce your students or colleagues? Here? Sure. This is my PhD student, Justin Suka. He's going to be doing a good bit of his dissertation work on the data associated with the larval study. So um, he's happy to interact with you guys as we take a look at everything. And feel free to ask us questions up here one on one. Okay.